What's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Superman's Comics. Got a new week, so we have some new market trends. That's right, this is that three up, three down. We're giving you three up market trends and three down market trends in the comic community. But before we get into it, last night we just aired a special one-off episode of our Simple Man's Comics and Friend podcast. It was one that could not wait for the normal schedule. And we had the founder and president of CBCS Comics, Steve Borak, on the channel. How do you think that went, Jack? Brian, like I gotta say, I, I thought it went extremely well. First off, it's a blessing to have an industry legend like Steve Borak on the Simple Man's Comics YouTube channel, as well as Simple Man's Comics Audio Network. But the thing about it is, it, bigger than that is, is what the implications of the interview was. The fact that now we have built this relationship with CBCS. Um, we're going to be working hand in hand with CBCS to try to build awareness for the brand. Uh, they're going to be supporting Simple Man's Comics. And I really have to say, you know, we've seen Steve go on a lot of different podcasts. He does a good job getting his stuff out there. But to be able to now represent the CBCS brand is something that we take as a very, very serious privilege and is something that was hard to hold back and was excited to be able to let it out yesterday. Yeah, it was definitely something that we've been working on for a little while. And also, Steve spoke on the podcast about the Hero Initiative. Make sure you guys check out heroinitiative.org. We've been working with Comic Core, another YouTube channel, great friends of ours, with that Hero Initiative. And that's a great, great organization. They do a lot of stuff for people in comics. So make sure you guys check out heroinitiative.org. But let's get into it right now, starting with that three up portion. And the first one we're talking about this week is profit. Now, I know Jack's giddy about this because he is that Rob Liefeld Homer. But why is this hot, Jack? Well, you know, it's funny. Right before we started recording, that was the accusation you made of me. But I, I and I don't blame you because when the profit first got rumored several months ago to be heading towards Netflix, um, and we saw Young Blood number two take off with both its pink lettering version as well as the green lettering variant, um, we saw these books spike, and there was a lot of talk at the time that this was an artificial spike that most of these Liefeld image properties have been discussed for option at one point or another, but we never see anything come to fruition. We haven't seen any of these great 90s characters kind of show up in any sort of form of media. So there was a lot of negative talk, and we saw this highly printed book go from a dollar bin fodder book all the way up to 10 to $15, and then crash right back down to about two or three, which I still have to say is impressive because it's more than the dollar bin book that it was. But Brian, we got some major news this week. Mark Gigenheim himself is going to be the man writing the script for the upcoming Profit television series. If you're not familiar with Mark Gigenheim, we are talking the man behind the Arrowverse, Arrow, Supergirl, The Flash, Legends of Tomorrow. We're talking about a man who has developed non-comic book television properties, uh, including some of the most kind of major television hits uh, of both network television as well as streaming service is as well as being involved in full length feature films. Uh, one that comes to mind is like Percy Jackson's monsters. You know, so he's done big budget. He's done small budget. He's done weekly episodic television. He's firmly entrenched in the comic book business. Uh, he's, he is the man when it comes to television with DC comics, you're kind of looking at the Feige of DC comics TV program. The one area where DC comics has gotten it right. And the books have spiked again. We're seeing sales of about eight to $10, which is obviously dramatically up from the two to $3, but I still feel like a lot of meat left on the bone. So, um, you know, the market's still kind of out. That green variant was popular with the first spike. This time around, the green variant seems very prevalent and the pink um, lettering seems to be the one people are going for. But either way, it's one to pay attention to. It's a black cover, a tough nine eight. I'm sitting this one out, but you guys have at it. And plus, you talked about it with Guggenheim, right, with the TV. He was also awesome in Police Academy and Three Men and a Baby. That's actually Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> <laughs> but the next one we're talking about on the three up this week is 
I love this one because this is one that we talk about a lot, especially when we talk about indie comics, we talk about the indie comic cycle, how they go up, they come down. This has been on the cold or the down list before. And we're talking about Aftershock Comics. Yeah, when have you ever seen a company spike, Brian, because of a job posting? Because that's what we're talking about here, guys. We are talking about a job posting. We are talking about Indeed. We are talking about Monster.com. We're talking about LinkedIn. We're talking about the fact that Aftershock Comics is actively looking for an assistant to develop television and film properties. This is an immediate hire. Um, the posting sounds very desperate. Newsarama picked up on it, ran the news story. Key Collector added it as a alert or notification of some sort. Um, so this is starting to make its rounds in the comic book community. Very tough to decide which books to target, right? Because you don't really know what this is. All we know is Aftershock, who's, there's been some talks recently, right? There's been some rumors that Aftershock has some things going on on the television and film side. And apparently these things are going on to kind of such a realistic and immediate degree that they need to hire somebody to help kind of develop these projects for them. Um, so that's a big step for an independent publisher. Uh, we're not, like I said, we're not seeing individualized spikes, but Aftershock Comics, man, they've been down for a long time. I would look for those one in 10 incentives. There was a long time where a lot of those one in 10 incentives, Brian, you and I were both ordering those. They, they weren't going any more than the regular cover was going for. So I, I think a lot of those number one issue, one in 10 incentives um, are ones to look out for. I think Baby Teeth is the one that like sticks out the most being that it's a Donny Cates property. Yeah. But What's uh, the animal one. Yeah, animosity is, is still hot. That one though it had been previous. Yeah, that would have been previously optioned. Um, there's some more recent ones though that I thought had a lot of um, a lot of potential. Yeah, there's a they have a bunch of great stories. I mean, if you like in the comics, especially they have a lot of great horror books too. Yeah. So if you're into indie and horror books, definitely check out some of those aftershock titles. But um, yeah, I'm I'm glad to see it on the hot list, and and it's crazy it's over a job listing, but. Uh, we're in a cycle where small buzz is big buzz at this point. Yeah, and it, and it really points out two things to me, Brian. Number one, I think that with no new releases of comics, these independent comic companies have been hustling. I think there's been a lot of meetings going on between Hollywood and these comics companies because suddenly we've seen just a flurry of action on that front. Secondly, what I think it's indicative of is you talk about this a lot, that lottery ticket aspect these no individual aftershock book is hot but we're what that's why i love this show is we're not overly reacting to the market we're spotting the trend early and trying to give you the viewer time to react to it so a lot of these aftershock books some of the ones we mentioned some of the other ones um i know brian you and i were both big on bad romance you know, i think that these are walk through hell can, yeah yeah walk through hell was great uh dark red these are books that i think you can buy cheap and you don't know if it's going to come to fruition. You don't know if it's going to turn out, but we're not talking huge print runs and it's a buy now and hold and it's a lottery ticket and you just never know. And Lollipop Kids, that's another good one. Yes. Yes, that is another good one. Really, they have a ton of titles that were are really good. Yeah. Um, it, as an investor, it just started to get to the point where their mo books weren't moving on the secondary market at all. So I'm glad to yeah. see this. And there's another one once convention season ever, whenever it kicks off again, if they have a booth at the convention, definitely go check them out because they're, they're really great to talk to and they have some great books on their, at their tables. So. Yes, we have a video on this channel of me at the Aftershock booth talking to them at Heroes Con last year. So check that video out. So then the last one for the three up portion this week, this has been big news. And I think people are also getting confused with some of the news, but we're talking about Swamp Thing, CD, CD. CW has the rights to Swamp Thing, but it's not the rights right now to make additional shows, right? It's just the rights to air that first season. Yeah, so this is what bumps me out about comics. Um, I, I'm not one of the people who blames, say, like the Key Collector app or uh, speculation websites or any individualized news source. I think it's really indicative of our culture. We're a headline reader. We're not reading those, those articles. And that so, a lot of headlines just say rights. Yes. You know? So the headlines that's going around with a picture is, you know, every news website, and I'm not talking about comic or speculation news, 
um, I'm talking about mainstream news is reporting that the CW has picked up the rights to Swamp Thing. And if you read that in and of itself, it makes you think, well, they picked up the rights to the property. That's not the case. Um, the DC app looks like it's going away. And it's very similar to what happened um, with like Lucifer and Constantine. Um, these were, you know, things that went away. The CW still showed reruns of them afterwards, um, did very well with them. They have this built-in DC Comics universe. They have this natural DC Comics audience. It's a natural progression. But you know what I saw today on eBay, Brian? I saw five copies of the first appearance of Swamp Thing sell. Now, five copies didn't sell yesterday. Matter of fact, no copies sold yesterday. No copies sold the day before. No copies sold the day before. So what does this tell you? This tells me that these copies are being bought, unfortunately, by people who are trying to be reactive to news and are not fully investigating the situation before reacting. Now, I don't think buying the first Swamp Thing is ever a bad buy at any market price. I think it's a book that's only going to go up. I also think Fishy, it has well, I mean, they might, benefit of the doubt, they might have been buying it because of the Justice League Dark coming on HBO Max. Well, benefit of the doubt, they might have been buying it, Brian, and if they get enough interest in the reruns, they may bring back season two on the CW. I don't think that's impossible. Um, and yes, HBO Max, we know Justice League Dark is coming, so it's a good time to buy into Swamp Thing. But that's actually the point that I want to make, Brian. As I'm doing this research and seeing these Swamp Thing 1 sell, Saga of Swamp Thing 1 sell, as well as, um, you know, uh, House of Secrets 92, what I'm noticing is the Justice League dark keys are down. I could have put them on the down portion of this list. I just didn't want to have Swamp Thing on there twice, kind of confusing people. But Justice League Dark right now are good buys, around $15 for those three keys that we've highlighted several times on the show. Um, so. It's it's a really interesting thing. Um, I, I think as a community, the biggest advice I can give is just do your research. If you're not sure, talk to people, um, but don't be so quick to react and spend money because that's where you get yourself into a hole. Yeah. So we're going to shift now from those upward trends to the downward trends, and we're going to start off with non keys, non key issues right now. This is a little bit more than run filler. There's a bunch that they can fit into this topic, but Jack. Tell us why non-keys are cold right now. Yeah, this was from a great discussion I had with a dealer friend of mine yesterday who pointed this out to me. So it's really something I had not thought of. But there is an inventory control issue going on with a lot of dealers because all right, you've been out of business for a couple months. That's if you own a shop. Now, if you own a shop, hopefully you're getting at least close to the point where we may be talking about opening these shops up soon. But now imagine if you're a convention dealer. These conventions are done for the year. I mean, I don't think we're going to see a single one. And if we do, it's going to be one or two at the end. And most dealers budget for a dozen or more. Um, luckily, as we've talked about on this program and several other programs, the comic market has been very strong. So dealers have been able to supplement that lost income by selling on eBay. But what sells on eBay? Key issues. Key issues are what are moving. When we talk about the market being strong, we're talking about first appearances. We're unless, you sell them, unless you sell them as runs, that's your best bet, I think. Yes, but it becomes more difficult on eBay, uh, especially with older books and where grading becomes extremely important. And what I think what this dealer was telling me and what I think a lot of dealers are probably going to end up running into is he's basically had three months of selling keys without a large ability to go buy because he's not at, at conventions. He's not hunting in these different small town shops when he's traveling. So he is starting to look at his inventory thinking, well, if convention season was to open tomorrow, what, what I've got a ton of is the filler issues. You know, they may be great vintage, amazing Spider-Man issues, but they're not the, the issues that are drawing people to your convention booth. And I started to do a little bit of research and I started to really notice that, yeah, you know, um, the filler issues, they've actually seen a lot of hits. If you were trying to put together a run, now is kind of the time to target some of those, whether it's Uncanny X-Men's or Amazing Spider-Man's or Mighty Thor's or whatever it, run is your run. Um, now is kind of the time to look at those. 
Yeah, or they're like me and they just don't have a lot of storage. So the only books they're buying would be key issues or right. something they actually want. <laughs> Which is, but that's also indicative of the hobby. We've all become key oriented. And, yeah. and you know, it, you look at the, you know, the, the, whether it's an app or the websites or the programs on this very YouTube channel, we're mostly highlighting key issues and first appearances. Yeah. You need to make a top 10 run filler list. <laughs> yeah. But either way, moving on to the next one on the three down, we talked about the profit being up. We got another Rob Liefeld character, and this one is Deadpool is down right now. As you can see, I got my little Deadpool guy behind me tonight, but could be down, still wouldn't. I'm not a big Liefeld fan, but I do like Deadpool. So, but yeah, I think right now Deadpool seems to have lost his swagger. Yeah, well, Deadpool's down in the last few days, and it's Rob's fault. Because Rob went and did an interview. Um, it was an online interview. I, I don't remember who it was with. But he was doing an interview. Uh, it was a video interview. And he got asked about Deadpool 3. And he just went off on this tangent. Um, this, I mean, I'm talking about, like, the interviewer. As an interviewer, Brian, you and I interview for the channel. You know, you're trying to control the environment because you have the next question and the next question and the next question you have to get to. You don't want to step on those questions and you want to make sure you're staying within your time structure. This interview at some, um, interviewer at some point put his hands up and was like, I'm going to let Rob go. And Rob was basically espounding his frustration with Marvel and Disney picking up the property. Um, but he did no favors for himself and he did no favors for the Deadpool franchise as he started to basically chastise Kevin Feige. And he said that, you know, they, they have no plans for Deadpool. There's zero plans. They don't know what they're going to do. He wouldn't bet on the Deadpool 3. So, so let me ask you this. That character's not creator-owned. It's owned by Marvel, which is owned by Disney. Yep. Do you think that would just be courtesy that they would keep Rob Life on the loop? Or they'd just be like, screw you. You're freaking hostile anyway. So oh, no, I think Rob Liefeld will not have a place at the table. Yeah. When they finally do inevitably get, I mean, they've already it. announced it, Stan, and they already announced that they're well, planning on keeping it. So, rated R, so the, well, this is what's confusing, though. It was announced that they're keeping it, and they were keeping it rated R by Bob Iger, who now is no longer in charge. So now he's still head of creative, so you would think that would still be in play. But another telling sign is Ryan Reynolds did an interview just the other day for one of the late night talk shows. And when asked about Deadpool 3, gave a much more political answer, said he's very hopeful, feels like it could show up in the MCU. He wouldn't care if they had to tone it down to show up in the MCU. He said he's got a million ideas for that. He's also got a million ideas if it stays in its own universe like the Joker. Great. But the telling thing about that is he said that he hadn't been contacted by anybody. So... We had two interviews within a week where the principal star and the creator, who was an executive producer and writer on the first movie, on the first set of two movies, the first franchise, said that we have no movement. Nothing's happening. I don't think, personally, we're going to see Deadpool until we see the mutants. So I don't think we're going to – I think that's the reason. I don't think we're going to see Deadpool till the X-Men are introduced in some form or fashion. First the X-Men and then the offshoot characters – we're probably looking at four years. That's probably a safe assessment. And for that, I think that there'll be some cooling of some Deadpool books over time. So that's something to pay attention to. Obviously, that first appearance is still in high demand. It's still a book everybody loves. But it goes ebbs and flows. It never really kind of deviates more than about $50, give or take. But if you can get it on that downside, that's great. Um, Beware, though, of those facsimiles. I saw another facsimile go off today for $81, and that makes me sad. A facsimile of the fool. <laughs> it was an intentional blurry picture, too. Oh, yeah. yeah First appearance did. of Deadpool with facsimile. Yeah. It's like a blurry, dark picture, and then you click the guy's auctions, and every other auction, it's like a beautiful picture. It's like you did that totally on yeah. purpose. Well, we'll move over to the last one, the three down. This was one that we talked about hot just within – six months or so everyone was hooked on that storyline with venom but we're talking about dylan brock being cold right now yeah and we're not talking about like ice cold okay so before we get the boo birds in the comment section we're talking about 20 to 25 dropping down to 15 to 17 um but that's significant so percentage a drop. Wise. yeah it's a drop and it's significant percentage wise and 
let's be honest, a lot of us were sitting with that book at 25, not ready to sell it yet. Be, why were we not willing to sell it at 25? Because we believe it could be worth more. So if you believed at 25, this book was going to be worth more than 25. It's a very good buy right now at $14.99 plus shipping for most every listing um, for either Venom 7 or Venom 9 or the late printings or the variants. You know what the big exception to this book is? And, you know, it was already a hot book. I'm not saying we had anything to do with it, but it was already a hot book. But I find it very interesting that Venom number seven, the Frankie's Comics variant, is on fire. Yeah. Absolutely on fire. The last few have gone up and up and up. You're talking about 90 bucks right now. I mean, this thing is just red hot. So, um, and I think that that's more indicative of the cover art and the, than it is of the first appearance. I think the first appearance just gives it a cool backup. But yeah, it just, Dylan hasn't commanded the, the pricing during this entire COVID situation. Uh, he's been kind of cold. And I just think it was because they were in the middle of that story versus Null, who seems to have gotten all the attention. Null has remained red hot throughout this entire pandemic. Um, and I just think it's kind of like a pick your poison. Venom fans seem to be rolling with Null and Dylan is kind of sliding off a bit which, I mean, it could rebound. And also, right before we stopped getting new Venom issues, we were starting to see that, like, Null and Dylan may have more in common than we think. So, you know, that's something to pay attention to because if they're linked the way a lot of people are imagining that they are, I think as Null goes, Dylan will go. Yeah, I agree. But I also think some of that's just, I think people's attention are down right now just because that low on comics like we keep talking about. I think as soon as you get some type of storyline or there's one panel that has some art that points to something with Dylan, that fervor is going to be back and people are going to yeah. be back buying up those uh, seven and nine copy comic. Yeah, seven and nine copies of Venom. But either way, guys, there's our three up, three down. Do us a favor, click that thumbs up button. And we'll start putting comments up on the screen from last week's episode. So do us a favor and comment. What do you think is hot? What do you think is cold right now? What do you think of our list? Let us know in the comments and we'll put those up on next week's show as well with Brian and Jack from Superman's Comics. I'll see you guys in the next video. I get some bands and I get some bands on my little baby. I get some bands and I get some bands on my little baby.